Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our teaching and learning together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much once again for giving us this beautiful day, Lord, where we can come together and learn from your word, and even as we learn on how to be, how our personal spiritual life must be as leaders, I pray, God, that you will Lord, minister and speak to our hearts, oh God, and teach us, help us to grow from strength to strength. Thank you for this time. We suffer this day into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, so the last class, we looked at chapter 15, the cell leader's personal spiritual life. So uh, point number one, we looked at maintain a personal, uh, a strong personal walk with God. So you and I as believers have to maintain a work that is strong. Uh, you know, as leaders, we will go through, uh, you know, uh, ups and downs. So we need to maintain our own spiritual uh, walk with God, right? That's that's priority. Uh, before you minister to others, uh, we talked about it. You can, we can only, what we do, we have to do before we teach and we have to, uh, what we have in our hearts is what we can right, give to others. Right? So uh, maintain a spiritual or personal uh, walk with God. And then we looked at also maintain a life that is consecrated to God. Right? Uh, you know, uh, the word consecration means to be separated, right? So we're saying, God, I'm, these are areas in my life that I may feel weak. These are areas in my life that uh, uh, I need your help. So God, I... I, I as a as a believer, we need to constantly consecrate, meaning to surrender to uh to you know just let go and let God work in our lives. That's called consecration. So you're saying, God, I consecrate my words, I consecrate my mind, my thoughts, my actions, uh uh my family. So you consecrate everything that you do. At Ephesians 4:27, we look at it, you know, the devil is uh, like a roaring lion, he's trying to look for or just a, just a small step and then this is going to come in so we got to always be on our guard right? so let's get into uh tap point three this is where we stop get rid of demonic strongholds in our life and this is interesting right now uh ephesians 6 12 be uh, let's read Ephesians 6 12. If you have it with you, uh, shall we just read that? Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. And even as you uh, find the words, let me just share this. And like, what is a stronghold? Right? Strongholds are thoughts and patterns in our mind where we have become tolerant to sin, where we have compromised and replaced the truth with a lie. That's giving a place giving Satan a place of influence and a place of defense in our minds. Look at that, right? So this is like a, the most, I would say one of the most accurate definitions of what a strong world is. Our patterns in the mind, right? Thoughts, patterns in the mind, where we have become tolerant to sin and we have compromised, replacing the truth with a lie. And the moment we do that, we are giving Satan influence in that area, right? And when we keep giving the enemy influence in that area, over time it becomes a bondage or becomes a stronghold. Right? Let me give you an example and then one of you can read Ephesians 6, 12. So for example, there's a believer, right? And here's another interesting point, see this. It says there can be strongholds in a believer's life, right? Uh, areas in the soul that are occupied and controlled by demonic spirit. So let's look at two areas, right? One is, look at a non-believer, non right? He doesn't know, he or she doesn't know, they're just living a worldly life. And the enemy is already, you know, uh, in their, you know, working in their lives, their thoughts, and he, he continues to work, right? Uh, but when you look at a believer, and the moment we become a believer, the Holy Spirit comes, the indwelling of the presence of the Holy Spirit comes and stays in us. But how can there be strongholds in a believer's life when the Holy Spirit is in us? Uh, right Now, our spirit is new, but our thinking, our, 
our words and our, our soul needs to be transformed, needs to be renewed. Right? Just because I've become a believer doesn't mean I will not get any temptations. That's why Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 12. He says, therefore, do not be conformed to this world, but trans be transformed by the re renewing of your mind. So for a believer, say, for example, there's a believer, he's 10 years in the Lord, he or she, right? 10 years in the Lord. And uh, he thinks, for example, he's he had an addiction of, uh, you know, let's let's take an example of alcohol, alcohol addiction, right? So it's been 10 years right, that he's a believer. But there are still, you know, these temptations that keep coming in. Or this person as a believer has gone, he has, you know, uh, uh, involved in alcohol, he's drinking, but nobody knows. Only he knows. It. Nobody knows. It, right. Uh, and not his wife, not his children, not his colleagues, not his family. Nobody knows. But it's their insight. He knows it. Now, if this believer does not go back to God and confess their sins, the devil will take a foothold. He will make that, you know, that stronghold even more stronger. Right? It's like he will grip that area of your life and he will keep suppressing and pressing and, and trying to bring every kind of worldly attack to that area of his life. Because that's his weakness. And that becomes a stronghold. Look at this. Through these strongholds, sinful activity is actually defended within us because of the thought patterns we have embraced in our mind. Look at that. Right? So, so this person, 10 years in the Lord, but, is it, but he drinks. Right? He is an alcohol. So he keeps telling himself, he's defending what he's doing, saying it's okay. Uh, you know, it's okay. I'm going to ask God to, you know, uh, I'm going to confess, and God will heal my, uh, you know, God will con uh, forgive my sins. And he keeps defending it. Okay, I'm not, I'm not like others. You know, I have a good family. I have a, I'm, I'm looking after my family. I'm doing what I have to do as a believer. This is just something in my life which nobody knows. What happens? It's a stronghold. Right. Instead of bringing that into light, going to God, going to the cross, asking for forgiveness, changing ways, if we keep embracing those lies, instead of submitting to the truth of God's word, these are areas where Satan has us found. Let's read Ephesians 6, uh, 12, if anyone has it ready. Ephesians 6, 12. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Yes. So we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So you and I have this responsibility of getting rid of strongholds in us. Remember that a Christian, we, as Christians, we cannot be possessed by demons. There's a difference between possession and oppression. Possessed is to be controlled by demons. Because you and I have the Holy Spirit inside of us, the enemy, okay, the enemy oppresses us. He brings us into bondage. He harasses us in place in our mind and our body. Right? Uh, and all of this is because we have given entrance uh, through our thoughts and our behaviors. Right, um, areas of uncontrollable habitual sin, uh, uncontrollable lust, compulsive behavior, are you know areas that are demonically energized. Uh, now, what we are also saying is we are not going to you know blame the devil for our sinful behavior. Right, uh, we must understand that you know. God has given us the wisdom. And if there are things that you and I have to do in the practical, we have to do it. 
Right? We must understand the seriousness of an immoral lifestyle. Right? Uh, the more we keep living in immorality, the more the doors are open for the enemy. Basically, we are saying we are opening the doors wide and saying we are allowing the enemy to come and affect our mind and our body. Right? So think of it this way. Right? Uh, the door is open. It's not like we're closing the door and then the devil is trying to open the door and come in. The mm -hmm. door is just open, he's just walking in. Very simple. Right. So we, the devil will say, you open the door, I came. Right. Uh, so we, you and I got to be very careful. Keep all those shut as believers, right? as, as leaders, keep all those shut to the end. Understand that uh, Satan uses these strongholds to keep us believers from being effective in ministry. Right? And uh, it is true, right? He can bring down an entire ministry just by any, it, it just one area is enough. It could be a weakness in money. It could be weakness sexually, sexual immorality, iniquity. It could be anything, right? Yeah, and so we got to be very careful, right? So uh, one of the books that I... I really enjoyed reading initially was laying the axe to the roots. I really suggest that you read this book. You may have read it already. I know you're in third year, uh, uh, but keep reading it. Right? Uh, it's, uh, it's just you know everything is from the scriptures, so it helps us to uh, you know look deep into our hearts and see okay, what are areas that I must uh, ask God for uh, healing and for forgiveness? Right? Laying the axe to the root. Okay, let's get to. Point number 50, receiving healing for offenses, hurts, and wounds. Now, uh, you know, life is full of challenges. We're going to work with people. We are going to hurt people. People are going to hurt us. We are going to offend people. People will offend us. There will be wounds. And it's a natural thing. Right? It, it will happen. Uh, it's not something, you know, somebody comes up to you and say, hey, you know, I'm very hurt by what this person says. There's nothing to be surprised about because that's how, that's what life is. We will, right? Uh, Luke 17, 1, then he said unto his disciples, it is, it, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. Right? So uh, to be effective ministers, we must not carry offenses, hurts, and wounds in our inner being. Is in our spirit. Uh, these will hinder the work of God and what God wants to release in and through us. Look at that. It's so important, right? Uh, uh, now, these offenses, hurts, and wounds can be something very small or it can be something very big as well. Right? So, uh, you know, if, uh, uh, somebody may have come and said to you, hey, you're, you're preaching, I think you need to change your style. It can be really offending. How can this person come to you know, I've been 10 years in ministry, he's telling me how to teach and how to preach, right? Or hurts could be something that somebody said to you, right? Uh, they may have looked at your appearance or looked at your studies when you were small. Uh, these are hurts, these are wounds that can uh, last for a very long time. And I've heard of people where, you know, they, they, are, they are early, they're in their 30s working, have a family, uh, but they're still hurt about what happened, you know, when you know, as friends when they were kids in school. My friends used to call me this, it just you know, I felt low, I felt that I'm nothing, I felt that I'm not, uh, uh, you know, I'm not capable of doing this. They're still, hurt. they're still holding on to those offenses and hurts and wounds. But remember to be effective in ministry to be effective in what God has called us to do. We need to let go of offenses. There is absolutely no use of holding on to offenses. It is not going to do anything to us. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to bring us any strength, but it's only going to affect our body. It's going to affect our mind and our spirit and soul. It will just affect us. So let go. Right. The best example is Jesus. Right. Uh, I'm sure, you know, when he was on the cross, uh, he would have, you know, the, 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 you know, the cross itself is an offense. The hurts and the wounds and uh, not just the physical, but the emotional pain that he went through. 
uh, it was too much for him to bear. And there was no one standing with him. None of his disciples were there except for John. No one there to console him and say, you know, you know, you know just picture this. Jesus is dying on the cross and Peter and all the disciples are there. Lord, you are doing it for us. I know, you know, just encouraging him on the cross. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it would I don't know what 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 Jesus may have felt, but I'm sure when he came back, he could have said, "Hey, y'all didn't stand with me. Y'all were not even there." But there was no offense. I, uh, he just let go of everything, and so we also must be that must uh, you know follow that Hebrews 12, 14 and fifteen. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any fruit, root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Bitterness can defile us. It can, you know, we, we are consecrated to God, but it can defile our life. It's a, it's a sin which can, you know, we continue to walk in that root of bitterness and uh, anger and hatred it's a sin to hate someone is to give them too much importance don't think about what people have done for you it's, it, it, giving them too much importance. let me tell you this world you know, you know i was just talking to a, you know, a believer recently and we were just talking and saying hey you, you know uh, we have what we can live for 80 years like 85 years uh, we cannot hold on to bitterness, resentment for years and years together and live with it. Life is not meant for that. It's like you're giving importance to something very small when God has got so much that's open and available that he wants to use. So renounce every feeling of uh, hatred, ill feel, and resentment. Uh, and those wounds, you know, the Bible says, uh, in, uh, in Jeremiah, he says he will heal all our wounds. He will bind up all our wounds. So you, right? When we surrender to God, He will bind those wounds, right? Uh, so remember to do this. We must learn to do this. Know and maintain your priorities. What are my priorities? Your personal walk with God, your family, your job, your work, then your ministry. You know, sometimes. Especially now, people have got this all the way wrong. They put point number four as one. That is, ministry is one. Then personal work. Then uh, you know, job. And then family. No. Know your priorities. Of course, this is not in order. Uh, uh, but, you know, it's, it's like this. You are in the center. And everything is surrounded. Your personal walk with God, your family, your work, your ministry, your finances, everything is around you. And, uh, and so you need to maintain those priorities. Right? Um, some things uh, to consider is activity does not mean accomplishment. Right? Um, just because you're doing something doesn't mean you'll accomplish something. Remember the story of the people of Israel? They came out of Egypt. What were they doing? They were going around one mountain. That's all they were doing. And if you think of it, there was Mount Seir, and the people came out of Egypt, and they're going around the mountain. They, it looked like they were gaining ground and reaching the promised land, but they were not. They were just going in circles. Right? So activity does not mean accomplishment. Work smarter, not harder. Organize or agonize, evaluate or stagnate. Uh, schedule your priorities uh, and say no to little things. Now, now remember, as leaders, this is something that we must do. Uh, there will be come a time where, as leaders, people will call you, people will ask you to do certain things, people will have suggestions, people will have a lot of ideas, and we cannot say yes to everyone. If we say yes to everyone, we will end up doing a hundred things not effectively. So as leaders, we must develop the ability to say no. And when we say no, so we say it gracefully. 
We are not saying no to the person, we're saying no to the idea. Now, this is an area which I really struggled with when I was, you know, uh, starting off in ministry because uh, I, I started off quite young and so I was okay. Whatever people say, I say, okay, yes, let's do it, let's go, yes, yes. It was just this habit of saying yes. And as leadership responsibilities came to me, I realized that uh, I kept saying yes to everything. So people would say, hey, can we do this? Or can we do this? Can we? I kept saying yes to everything. And I realized that uh, I was doing too many things. And it was, it was like becoming a burnout for me. So over time, I realized, hey, I need to say no. I need to know how to learn how to say no gracefully. The first initial times I was quite afraid. How do I say no? But I realized I'm not saying no to the person. I'm saying no to the idea, right? Uh, uh, and and when you talk to the person, you're saying okay. You're not just saying no, but you're also giving an alternative, right? So that could be a good uh, come with an alternative. Right? So I remember, uh, for example, if somebody comes up to you and say, "Hey, let's have worship evening in church on Friday." Uh, don't just say no, no, no on Friday. It's not not a good idea. That won't be the right thing. Right? So you say, hey, that's a good idea. We need to do worship evenings. We need to get the church together. So, uh, but don't you feel that Friday is a working day? So people come back from work. They may come back late. They may be tired. They may not be able to come. How about we do it on a Saturday? Right? Do you think Saturday at the evening is something that we can do? Uh, so what are you doing? You're coming up with an alternative. Uh, oh no, but Saturdays is, you know, people, uh, families want to rest, they want to do their work, housework, and things to get done at home. Okay, then what we can do is we can have worship evening in people's homes. That can come up, that's a good idea. So, so when you say no, you say it gracefully, you come up with an alternative and let the person know that you're, you're not just you know, throwing the idea away, but you're coming up with some alternatives. Right? Uh, and that way they will feel encouraged as well. And then be an example. We talked about this, right? Be an example. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 12. Lord, let no man despise thy youth, uh, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Right? So... Yeah, so the greatest message you and I can preach is the life we live. Sometimes we don't need preaching. You live the life. So the Apostle Paul says, you follow me like I have followed. I have followed God. Right? Now, this, this being an example, right? Um, a genuine leader is consistent with what he says and what he does. I right? underline that word consistent, meaning just put it in your spirit. Consistent. Right. For example, you you look at any sportsman, right? a footballer, any sports activity. Right? This is an example. Uh, they probably start off when they were yeah, children. Right? Nowadays, we have all these uh, sports and training centers and clubs and all of that. So children start off from the age of six, seven. Right? Uh, but what is it that makes a person get up to the highest level in that sport. All, many of them are starting at six and seven, seven years of age. What is it that they, why is it that they are, you know, there's only two or three out of the, uh, you know, maybe hundreds and thousands, only two or three reach up to the highest place of the world. That is because they are consistent. Consistency will bring productivity. Uh, you know, they don't give up. Failure will not bring them down. Right? Just because a 400 meter runner has been training for 10 years and he loses a race doesn't mean he will give up. If he gives up, then I would say he's not consistent. But you would always see, you would always see, okay, I'm going to get back and run the next year and try to do it better. That's called consistency. Right? Uh, and not changing your words, not changing your actions just because of situations that are happening. Now, as a leader, situations will happen. Right now, uh, you've got to be consistent in what you said, what you're doing. Your character, or our character, 
is the foundation on which our ministry stands. And I always say this. Uh, gifts and skills can take us up the ladder, can really reach high, but it's a character that keeps us there. Otherwise, bad character will fall off the ladder in a second. And we've heard of ministries, we've heard of people who have gone right up to the top, but because of bad character, they crash down in no time. Right? So your our character is the foundation of our ministry. Ministry stands on that. Of course, Jesus is our cornerstone, and he we build the ministry on that. Uh, but he expects us to work. We are to. Jesus is not going to come and say, "Okay, this is your calendar for ABC 2025, uh, 2025 calendar." So your church do these events. No, we got to do it. It's a practical. So remember, we always reproduce after our own kind. Brave, bold, passionate, and strong leaders will reproduce the same kind of leaders. So be brave, be bold, be godly, be passionate about what you're doing. Right? And the moment you lose your passion for something, go back to God. It's not wrong to lose passion. Right? Uh, sometimes doing ministry just gets you tired, you may get weary, you may feel, God, uh, where are you? Just feel alone. Uh, and just go back to God. Go back under the shadow of his wings and say, God, I want to receive from you. And uh, uh, give me that strength again, that passion, that desire to serve you and to serve your people. Right? Uh, now, it's not wrong to, remember, it's not wrong to, lose passion during the journey and god is merciful right? he, he will help us when we continue to speak to us to be better leaders right okay uh any questions any thoughts before we go to the next chapter any questions okay Yes, any questions? So, so far, so good, Pastor. Sorry? So far, so good, sir. Okay, so shall we continue? True. Okay. Right. Okay, let's get into the next, the heart of a leader. The heart of a leader. Uh, being a leader in God's kingdom is definitely not easy. Right. And you look at the scriptures and you look at the Old Testament, especially, oh, being a leader or a prophet of the Old Testament was a heavy load to carry. You picture this, picture Moses standing there in front of about two million people. He's brought his people out of Egypt. He's standing at the, you know, God directed them to the Red Sea. Look at Exodus. God directed the people. If you look back, you can you can hear the sounds of Pharaoh and his army. If you look in front, you got the Red Sea. What did they want to do? What did they say? Moses, why did you bring us here? Didn't we have enough? There, are there no graves in Egypt that you brought us here? Now, this is probably one month after coming out of the out of Egypt. They've seen miracles already. They've seen that the plagues didn't touch them. I said. Moses, why did you do this? Why did you bring us here to die when we could have died in Egypt itself? And, you know, it, 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 it's such a sad thing when you read through the Exodus, right? Uh, but God was so faithful. You know, that's why he keeps saying, if you read Exodus, it says, he keeps saying, how long do I do deal with these people? How long do I keep telling them? They parted the season to do. They went, they crossed. Oh, praise God. Uh, you know, he they're all singing songs and they go a little further. A few days later, there's no water. Why did you bring us into the desert to kill us? Right? Uh, it's not easy. People are wired differently. Dealing with people is not easy. Leadership brings great responsibility. Okay, let's look at a few points, right? Number one, leadership. It's a life of servanthood. Okay. Now, here's the 
very important. There is a balance when you talk about servitude. There's humility, there's authority. Right? So it's not a, oh, I'm a servant of God, I, you know, inferior. Nobody, uh, nobody say anything to me. No, I'm not inferior, nor am I superior. Not a superiority complex. Oh, I'm, I'm a servant of God. I'm, I, I can do whatever you know I want to do. No. Look at Jesus. Uh, uh, we know the story in John 13, 3 to 17. Uh, I'll just uh, summarize it, and then we can read it later. Look at Jesus. Was he humble? He was. Did he walk in authority? Did. Did they, when the demons came, did he say, oh, no, uh, I'm humble, so can you come back later? No. Right? What did he do? He, he used his authority, his superiority, and he said, hey, demons, get out. Be gone, is what he said. Right? Uh, uh, when, you know, when he brought healing upon people, he did it uh, not out of pride, but out of compassion. Uh, out of love for the people, but he knew that he was greater than what the enemy is. Right? But he also walked in humility. Right? Where he washed the disciples' feet, this passage, John 13, 3. Can you picture this? He got this man who calms the storms with his hand, who walked on the waters, who did these great miracles. And now he's washing the feet of the disciples, the same feet where he walked on water, he did these great miracles. Like demons are, uh, you know, uh, afraid of him. But this man of great authority, great wisdom, is washing the disciples' feet. Look at what he says in this verse, verse thirteen. He called me master and lord, and you shall say well. For so I am, I am your master. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash another's feet. But I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, I say to, to you, servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy or glad are you if you do them if i then god the lord jesus is saying no I, I, i'm not, he's not saying i'm not your master he's saying i you know i'm your master you know that i'm the son of god right you know what i've done and you've seen the miracles you've seen me taking five loaves of bread and two fish and feeding thousands of people you've seen me coming to storm you've seen the devils run away i am your master i am your lord i am the son of God, but being the son of God, right? Uh, I'm humbling myself to wash your feet. This is an example that you must do the same, right? And what a powerful example that you and I, as leaders, must maintain this balance. You know, uh, there's a saying, right? When you kneel and pray before God. You will be able to stand in the world right? because you'll be able to fight every demon because you have humbled yourself at me knelt before god what you know they're saying god these three points lord i'm not i cannot do it on my own i'm not self-sufficient lord i am not whatever i have is not because of me. it's not my greatness it's not my power it's not my strength without you i've been nothing and to be powerful, right? Saying, Lord, I'm in control over everything. We are not in control of anything. I love what Psalms 139 says, and I read it every time. It just, it just brings such a peace in our hearts, especially during times of trauma. Right? Psalms 139. I knit you together in your mother's womb, even before a day came to you. I have written all the days of your life. We cannot add a single day extra into our life just because uh, we may feel we are powerful. We, we cannot. We cannot do that. 
right? So when we understand the magnitude of who we are, our thought process changes. That's why you say, God, whatever you call me for, help me to be faithful, fulfill this, and to finish the work which you have called me to do. Right? So these three are temptations we must avoid. Saying, God, I can do it on my own thing, I'll do it on my own. To be a spectacular saying, okay, these miracles, these wonderful things that I'm seeing is because of because of my hard work and my ability, or the thing to saying that I'm in charge of everything. And we are in charge of nothing. Right? The Bible says he holds the sun and the moon and the stars in his hand. So he is in control of everything in our life. Uh, Christ like servant leaders are motivated by love to serve others. We, we, we are not, you know, ministry is not just for people to look at us, it is to serve. When we, you know, I would say this the greatest joy for a leader is to see someone who is just maybe immature in Christ and all of us you know you're working with them and you see them become leaders in the ministry preaching the word ministering to people and driving out demons healing the sick that is the greatest motivation for a leader right even if it's you got an example you got a church of 50 people and that 50 people you got five people who are doing this casting out demons cleansing the lepers cleaning, uh, you know, praying and for healing and just destroying the works of the devil. That is the greatest motivation that you and I can have as leaders. Okay. Now it's not wrong to have big churches, more people come into church. But church is about people. We are the church. So we need to love and serve others. Possess a security that allows them to minister to others. Uh, uh, security is the prerequisite to great undertakings, which means uh, when you talk about prerequisite, that means when we we are secure in our heart, right? Uh, we say, okay, what will happen if people, if this pastoral or leadership role is taken off from under you? I always have this picture in my mind. Say there's a carpet under you and you're standing under that carpet. And you're very happy, okay, I'm standing under this carpet. Now suddenly the carpet is pulled off from under you. Will you stumble and fall? Or will you continue to stand saying nothing changes? Right. And I think uh, we should come to that place. We are not, uh, we have titles, we have callings, God calls us, pastors, evangelists, we, I talk about the fivefold ministry as well. Uh, that's that's there, but our security is not on that, not on our titles, not on what we have, what we have done, what we're going to do. But our security is in Christ. When even when everything is taken away, we can stand still and know that God is with us. When God looks at us, He's not going to look at He's not going to look at us and say, "Hello, Pastor." It's not. It doesn't matter to Him. Right? So, our security. What are we? Uh, when we are secure about who we are, about our position, we begin to minister to people out of that security, knowing that uh, you know you're, you're doing it as a service to others. Three: initiate servant ministry to others. Teach your people. Right? Teach your leaders. Teach uh, the people who are under you what is servant ministry all about. Uh, receive servant ministry from others. Right? Uh, even when people are serving you, good. Right? Receive that ministry and receive it with a humble heart. It's okay, no, you have to do uh, uh, what you're doing is right because I've been ten years in ministry or twenty years in ministry. So, uh, so good. What you're doing is no. receive it. Right. Uh, look at the disciples. They said, "No, God, don't, God, don't do this. How can you do this? We know who you are. How can you wash our feet?" They were not stretching their legs and saying, "Go ahead, Jesus." No, they received it with humility as well. Right. Teach servanthood by example, like 
uh, we're talking about this people do what they see uh, so it could be small things right say for example at church uh, you know coming in church uh, or you're doing as a minister as a leader uh, you want water you go fill your water bottle or your glass of water and you drink it you don't have to have one assistant to go and get it for you simple just being very simple if you want to you know do something like right? and for your family you do it don't get people from outside your family is family and ministry is ministry right always learn to keep them separate right? okay everyone with me Okay, let's get into the next point. Uh, keep a constant examination on your hard attitudes. Okay, we talked about this, right? Your hard attitudes. Uh, uh, meaning, leadership begins with an attitude. And um, biblical principles or biblical attitudes is uh, my attitude as I begin a task will affect its outcome more than anything else. So, we've got a whole list. Remember, our attitude is contagious, right? Uh, my attitude not my achievements will give me happiness right? my attitude to something will change when i choose to change it right? uh, you know especially when you're starting a ministry you get leadership roles uh, initially you're excited we are excited we want to do everything that we can we put it up 200 percent uh, but over time that 200 percent becomes lesser and lesser and lesser why? Because my attitude towards the leadership has changed. We need to ensure that, hey, I need to change my attitude. This is what I'm doing. Uh, maybe the same thing I'm doing, but remember that I'm, I'm, I'm doing something that is uh, making an impact for the kingdom of God. Uh, my attitude needs continual adjustments. I, my attitude can turn my problems into blessings because I'm just choosing and picking a few. Uh, my attitude towards others determines my attitude, their attitude towards me. If I'm able to have a good attitude to others, that's what I will get back. That's what will specificate that. So just build on your attitudes, uh, biblical attitudes. And yes, yes, there will be attitudes that we may have to change over time. Uh, so do that right now, and then God will continue to help us. Next one, be a dreamer, Acts chapter 2, 17 and 18. Yes, anyone would like to read? And we'll also read Ephesians 3, 20. Ephesians 3, 20. Go ahead. Acts chapter 2, sorry, 2, 17 and 18. Anyone like to read this? Acts chapter 2, verses uh, 17 and 18. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says, that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men uh, shall dream dreams. and my men servants and all my maids says, I'll pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. Yeah. So God does not give us dreams and dreams to, to entertain us. Right? Uh, it is given to us to accomplish something on earth. And a God given God given vision births a purpose into our life. Right. But we have a vision as a purpose. We say, okay, this is what I have to do right it could be not only in ministry but in anything right it could be business could be a financial family uh, when you have a god-given vision it it has a purpose and that purpose has to be pursued by us the vision is given by god we have to pursue it right sometimes these god-given visions and dreams are much bigger than what we are because now listen god does not look at our capabilities and how we can accomplish them. Did you ever think, let's look at two examples. Moses, 
a person who could not talk, 80 years old, will bring out 2 million people out of Egypt. He said, I can't talk. Okay, take care of it. But when God saw Moses, he said, no, I know you're going to do it. It doesn't matter you're 80 or 100. When God saw Abraham. He said, I want to make you the father of many nations. So in God's mind, it's already set. He doesn't look at our capabilities. Abraham was as dead as can be. So was Sarah as well. He was too old. God, God does not look at those capabilities. When he says something, he will do it. All he needs is eaten vessels. Right? That's why Ephesians 3.20 is powerful. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, more than we can ask, more than we can think, more than we can imagine, according to the power of that is his power by working in us. When you and I receive a vision from God, he wants to do it for you. He wants to do it in you. And he wants to accomplish it through you. Look at Peter. Did, you, did, did Peter ever think that he's going to lead a ministry of thousands of people? After Jesus, who took on the whole ministry? A fisherman who, who was fearful, who, who denied God, who was you know, a person who denied and he was uh, very weary, short-tempered. Not saying, no, I don't see all of that. All of that may be there. But I see Peter as a leader. So when God gives you a vision, you hold on to it. And you begin to work on it. Don't say, okay, God has given the vision, so whatever skills he wants, he will make me get it. Also. We have to learn, grow, okay, God, this is the vision, uh, so I have to learn all of this. I learn how to, uh, if it's a church, God has given you a vision to start a church. There's a lot of things that we need to learn. How to build a church, how to organize, how to uh, lead people, how to raise leaders. So much to learn. Right? So we learn. Be totally committed. Uh, mediocre commitment will not produce much. Uh, it will produce, but not much. And be positive. God has never failed. Uh, 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 you know, there will be ups and downs. An optimistic attitude energizes and transforms those around us. Right? This is a powerful verse. Uh, okay, let's just quickly read this, right? Uh, so David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. So David and his men went for, uh, just to give you context, they went for a uh, war, and when they came back, they saw all of this. Uh, uh, the city was burned, their wives and their sons and daughters were taken captive, and David and the people uh, that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until uh, they had no power to weep. Imagine. And David's two wives also were taken captives. And, and David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved, obviously, right? Their, their family, their children, everyone had been taken, right? But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Look at this. What a powerful verse. Right? They've gone for war. They've got victory. They've come back. They've seen that the soul of the cabin. People have come, or the enemy has come and taken everyone, wife, children, everyone. It's an empty place. The, 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 the army is crying out about God. Why did you allow this to happen? David himself also was greatly distressed. But David encouraged himself in the room. Right? And David said to the priest, I pray thee, bring me the effort and uh, bring me the effort to David. And David inquired of the Lord. Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover them. And that's what happened. Right? David was distressed. He encouraged himself in the Lord. He inquired of the Lord. God said, Okay, David, go back. By the time you go, you will bring the, all your people will come back. Don't worry. I'm there with you. You will overtake them and you will bring your people back. Always maintain a strong, positive, triumphant attitude. The enemy will come with sudden news. You hold on to the promises of God. He will always cause us to triumph. 
We overcome evil with good. We overcome fear with faith. We overcome adversity with tenacity. We overcome negativity, right? By being positive. And, and you and I, you know, we are designed, we may fail, uh, but remember that God will help us. God will definitely help us. Uh, be encouraged with the Lord. We'll stop here. We'll get into chapter 17, uh, the next session. Uh, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. I'll see you. God bless. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.